Hey, hey y'all. Happy New Year. Clowns. Hated and or feared by most. Clowns have been around for centuries and have evolved quite a bit. They come in all forms. Jugglers and jesters and harlequins and hobos um, and some others that I... I'm not going to try to pronounce really. I'm sure one thing that you're probably wondering about clowns, when did they become so creepy? I guess they were always creepy. Yikes. But I more so mean universally. Like when did they universally become thought of as a thing of nightmares? There are many specific pieces of media one might point to as being what started the scary clown phenomenon. Maybe someone would say, hey, it was Stephen King's It or serial killer John Wayne Gacy's side gig as Pogo the Clown or 1928 film The Man Who Laughs. According to Benjamin Radford, author of Bad Clowns, it's misleading to ask when clowns turned bad, for they were never really good. As our cursory review of early clown history reveals, a dark side had always lurked just below their caricatured features and painted smiles. Clowns and jesters have always been strikingly ambiguous characters, neither clear heroes nor villains but either or both at different times as suits their murky purposes. And this ambiguity is what has always made clowns so scary. Late great horror actor Lon Chaney, who played a clown himself, put it perfectly. What is the nature of a clown that makes it scary? A clown is funny in the circus ring, but what would be the normal reaction to opening a door at midnight and finding the same clown there in the moonlight? Unlike a lot of fears and phobias it's pretty easy to avoid a clown since you're only gonna run into them in like one of two places there's the circus and possibly a children's birthday party three places the gathering of the jugglers when you do spot a clown outside of his social habitats it can raise a ton of suspicion and fear like baby ashes serving clown looks at the school halloween parade but this fear is chorophobia and that is the technical term for it. You'll see examples of it everywhere. Johnny Depp has once stated he had a fear of clowns. You'll see it in TV and children's cartoons and comedy shows. And most popularly, the uh, horror movie. You know, you got Pennywise, the most popular of the bunch. He is the uh, goat. Um, I know this next one isn't necessarily horror, but we have the Joker in his many iterations. Then Art, Captain Spaulding, those dudes from outer space. The lesser known Eric Slater, and uh, those fucking dolls from Poltergeist and Ghost House. I'm not even gonna get, get into all those other low-budget clown movies that exist because, you know, they don't matter. And I am positively sure that they fucking suck ass. The clowns I will be highlighting today, though, are Lunatic, Chizo, Mippo, and Dippo from 1989's Clown House. But it's not really about these clowns. I think it's just what they have come to really represent when analyzing the movie along with the revelations of what happened between the writer-director Victor Salva and the star of the movie, the then 12-year-old Nathan Forrest Winters. Strong trigger warning. The video will contain themes of grooming and CSA and injustice, which will most likely cause intense feelings of rage. But I will be getting into the details of the controversy after breaking down the movie for a few reasons. Because A, if you're someone who doesn't know anything, I think it will be interesting and beneficial to kind of see what happens in the movie before really learning the severity of everything. B, if you know, then you can wait and see. I just spent a whole bunch of time talking mad shit about clowns 
and, and stuff, so um, I think we should just get right into it. Along with the movie breakdown, I will be referencing Sava's blog post. Now, he has a, a blog up on Blogspot. It's not active anymore. It was active around about almost a decade ago. I had the misfortune of scouring through all the posts. I did find tidbits here and there that I thought would make sense and actually be important to just the movie and theme of the video, you know? So yeah, let's do this. The first scene is of our main character, Casey's Nightmare. Again, Casey is portrayed by Nathan Forrest Winters. Casey straight up suffers from chorophobia. The dream results in him wetting the bed, something that he also suffers with as a result of this phobia, he awakens and then removes his underwear. The next morning, middle brother Jeffrey, played by Brian McHugh, wakes up and uh, he decides he's gonna wake his brothers up as well. His bedroom door is adorned with an Outsiders movie adaptation poster. Now this might seem innocuous. However, this adaptation was directed by Francis Ford Coppola, who will play a major role in this later on, and I don't mean the movie, I mean the actual controversy behind this. Anyway, Jeffrey, this character, brings balance to the trio of brothers, and we also inexplicably have to watch him walking around in his underwear. He, he does interrupt his older brother Randy's vigorous session of Nothing's gonna fall off. Well, Jeffrey is immediately seen as very protective and supportive of his younger brother, Casey, who he realizes has just suffered from some night terror and has wet the bed. And older brother, Randy, is the opposite. He is an absolute bully. And I will note that for some reason or other, uh, the scene includes a bare ass shot of Casey. Just doesn't seem necessary, but I guess we know the reason. And of course, I cannot go without mentioning that Randy is played by the one and only Sam Rockwell. This is actually his debut role, and he is the only successful actor to come out of this movie, the only recognizable one. Randy is immediately aware of Casey wetting the bed as well, which he then, instead of comforting his brother, goes and tells his mother. Hey mom! Casey wet the bed again! So Randy, you know, he is just the uh, quintessential trope of the mean, just relentless bully of an older brother that you'll see in TV and movies. The scene does conclude with more uncomfortableness as we see Casey some more, a little bit too much of Casey in his underwear. As the boys are at the breakfast table, Randy is reading the paper and he sees an ad for the circus that will be in town that night. I don't care what you guys do tonight, but whatever it is, it's gonna be together. Whoa, 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 whoa. Madre, slow down. <laughs> Kidnap a dog, rob a store, kick it up a notch, rob a grave. I don't care, as long as y'all do it together. This is when they have a brief discussion of Casey being afraid of clowns and we learned that he had an incident at the circus the year before. But the only one that seems to take his fear seriously is Jeffrey, of course, and you'll even notice this when he has a short exchange with his mother. That was last year, huh, Casey? Casey, you want to tell me why you really don't want to go tonight? And this will be the last time you see his mom in the movie and you never see the dad. The parents are absent throughout the movie. And there also does seem to be some kind of a strain between the two as they showed a little earlier. When are we going to start living like a normal family? When are we going to start fixing this place up? I feel that this is one of those elements that Salva definitely threw in to kind of mirror his upbringing. You know, according to his blog, he and his siblings, as opposed to the three brothers in the movie, were actually abused by their alcoholic stepfather and mother. However, there seems to be just like this level of neglect and dismissiveness and absence when it comes to the movie parents. There's no real hints of substance abuse there. Randy gets scolded by his mother for hanging this really morbid Halloween prop and he's asked to take it down. This hangman noose makes several appearances throughout the movie. Now I'm sure this represents something, perhaps restraints or anxiety, maybe due to him being publicly humiliated the year prior or possibly a much darker ideation. After school, they don't, they don't show the school day though. I have to point that out. 
And I think this is another intentional thing that Salva did because another thing he really loves to talk about in his blog or loved to, to mention in his blog was that when he was in school, he was happy. He got to escape the abuse at home and in school, his life was completely different. He was popular. He was in school government. He was in drama. He did plays. He was just like, he had girlfriends, you know, all that popular kid shit. I don't really have any experience with that anyway again it's after school the three brothers have somehow joined together they're walking outside i'm not sure where they're going to either way randy is incessantly teasing casey about his fear of clowns because of course they are supposed to see see some clowns later they're gonna clown with some clowns but chase but what about those clowns but then some sirens do catch their attention. Uh, there's a bit of foreshadowing from Jeff here. Where the crazy people live. What the hell's going on? Maybe they try to break in. You know? Maybe to go to the circus. But then we do cut to the boys finally arriving to the circus grounds. And Casey seems to be drawn to this um, tent that's a fortune teller's tent. And he wants to go in and check it out. But the fortune teller doesn't seem to have very good news for Casey. Something very soon is cutting through your lifeline. Or Randy. With you. The next scene is essentially history repeating itself. First, they show us this without context. I guess to further solidify just how shitty Randy is, not just in his familial relationships, but his romantic ones as well. The most important part of the scene is when Casey is approached by regular Chizo when he's looking for a volunteer for his act. Of course, though, just like the year before, Casey kind of just freaks out and knocks Chizo over and runs out of the tent in absolute fear. Jeffrey does follow and attempt to console Casey when Casey reveals what it is exactly that terrifies him about clowns. Their faces are fake, big happy eyes, big pain smiles. It's not real. You never know what they really are. Meanwhile, the escaped mental patients that were um, discussed right before have arrived at the circus grounds as well. Casey and Jeffrey at this point are playing carnival games. And this scene is like, to me, kind of a crucial scene to bring up. Not in the context of the actual movie, but in terms of the controversy surrounding it. Because it's downright fucking creepy. It is. Uh, it's a creepy scene and it has nothing to do with the scripted scene again it is just how it was filmed because we had a little cameo right here of victor salva standing very close behind casey does it make it better when the carney asks casey this what's your secret kid never think straight <laughs> look at that creepy slimy face that salva has i did want to point this out and further elaborate because victor salva does bring it up on his blog he called it doing a hitchcock and he continued to do this with his following films claiming that this was just a note to hitchcock who was famous for doing cameos in all of his films now this may very well be the truth who knows right but wouldn't it just be in his best interest if he continued this because in the event that someone pointed this scene out and it's like yeah what the fuck is this he could be like no this is this thing i do you know but no doesn't help because it's how he did it he could have did anything literally anything else but stand literally half an inch behind casey in this scene he could have been in the crowd watching chizo bippo and dippo he could have not he could have been five feet further behind casey anyway the boys head home and the escaped mental patients find the tent that belongs to chizo bippo and dippo and they murder them and assume their clown identities therefore becoming lunatic chizo bippo and dippo i refer to them as such because that is how they're credited back at the house randy he brings up that he wants to tell some ghost stories something that casey is actually eager to participate in 
as they are telling a story which naturally has to do with clowns, the killer clowns happen to be making their way to the area which, where the boys live. Uh, so Randy, Jeffrey, and Casey are having a very good time together. It's this very rare shot of the three not bickering. Then Randy decides that he's going to turn the lights on and off and on and off, inadvertently making the house the target for the murderous clowns. And just as it seems like Casey is making some kind of progress in terms of his chlorophyll, Phobia, at least a tiny, tiny bit. He happens to glance out the front yard when the clowns are kind of messing with the noose. Wasn't Randy supposed to take this down? I don't think the problem was the dummy. I think the problem's the noose. You can't just have nooses hanging in fucking yards, guy. When he does attempt to warn his brothers about what he just saw, the clowns do disappear, causing Casey to wonder whether or not what he saw was real. Something real? Or not, Case. The three keep mentioning that they would like to go to the kitchen, but they're not allowed in the kitchen. And, you know, they'd want something to eat, but they might get in trouble. They do decide that they're going to go make some popcorn. However, they then realize that they ran all out. This initially did stick out to me. I found it very weird that they kept emphasizing that they were not allowed in the kitchen. It just seemed like so random and <laughs> specific. However, this is just a little thing that Salva again threw in that mirrored his childhood. He does discuss that his siblings were forbidden from the fridge and from the kitchen, especially when the parents weren't around and this is not due to them lacking any food or struggling or starving. It just was a part of the whole abuse and control. Casey and Randy decide that they're going to go to the general store to get some popcorn before it closes. However, they don't have much time, so they have to take this creepy path there as a shortcut. Jeffrey, on the other hand, he is not about it. He seems too scared to go, so he stays home. They marry this with the three killer clowns as Chizo and one one of the Ippos, and I don't know, I don't fucking know which one, decides to follow Casey and Randy, and the other Ippo stays around the house where Jeffrey is at. During their trip, Casey feels as if they're being followed. Randy is, of course, skeptical, but to make this trip a little easier, he decides he's going to challenge Casey to a race to the store and offer him jelly beans if he wins. This doesn't go so well since Casey kind of just runs right into Randy once they get to the store and knocks down this display, causing Randy to quite literally sit on a Twinkie, something that the very straight and manly Randy doesn't take too kindly to. I'm gonna kill you, you little turd. We got this character, Jasper. He's like a, the help at the store. He's a real bumpkin, a real simpleton, you might say. And he's the next victim. Clearly just added to include more um, horror to this movie, a kill count. Casey spots Chizo as they're walking back to the house when him and Randy are briefly separated. He, of course, runs away and this results in the only scene where we see like any kind of brotherly love from Randy when he basically allows Casey to hold his hand. However, this act of brotherly love will be very brief and quickly ends after Jeffrey plays a prank on Randy. Sick you shit. I had to kill you. I had to fucking kill you. You want any of this? You're gonna have to kill me for Things start to pick up from here on out. As we enter the final act of the movie, the boys are watching a spooky movie when the power gives out. And since the front door is open for some godforsaken reason, the trio of clowns are able to make their way into the house with no effort. Now, they're all too shook to like volunteer themselves to go fix the fuse box, so they decide to draw some matchsticks and Randy ends up losing. While Jeffrey and Casey are in Jeffrey's room reading comics and whatnot, Randy is attempting to fix the fuse box with no luck. When he happens to touch some what appears to be white clown makeup on the banister, which gives him this real great idea to spook his brothers out. We're coming to get you, Jeffrey Casey. This just immediately backfires on him because they lock the door and he ends up getting just straight up attacked by the three clowns. However, this noise is what causes both Casey and Jeffrey to exit the room and inspect what's going on and finally come face to face with Chizo, Bippo, and Dippo, who Casey believes are figments of his imagination for a brief moment until Jeffrey is able to see them as well and react. 
Now I will breeze through the rest. Jeffrey and Casey work as a team to take out the Bippo and Dippo clowns. And when given an opportunity to escape, Casey decides that he's gonna, you know, man up. He's gonna build up some courage and enter back into the house to find Randy. Much to Jeffrey's dismay. Unfortunately though, for the two, they discover Randy's lifeless body in the closet. Now there is some speculation as to whether or not Randy is actually alive because we do not see him conscious after this. I believe he's dead. There is absolutely no reason for the clowns to spare Randy as they have not done this prior with any victim. And at this point, they're trying to kill children. So he's dead. To further back up the fact that he is dead, if you recall the scene in The Fortune Teller, while Casey is revealed to have a scar causing the short lifeline on his hand. That's where your stitches were, wasn't it, Casey? A scar. It's right here. No, this is left. Randy has no such scar, meaning he therefore has a short life line. Jeffrey is then knocked out, leaving Casey to face Chizo, aka his fear, all on his own. He attempts to call the cops, but says that there are clowns in the house, and of course, this whole town knows Casey's issue with clowns, so this ultimately just does not help him. You think maybe you might just have woken up? You know, like maybe it's he should have said they were intruders, but of course this wouldn't be very um, beneficial to the ending of this movie. And then there's this final scene. Jeffrey, revealed to still be alive, comes to Casey's rescue and kills Chizo with an axe to the back. And the movie also ends with this quote, not credited to anyone. I'm not entirely sure of the origin of the quote, but I think that we're going to jump into a quick summary of the controversy surrounding the movie before I give any kind of thoughts on the movie. Again, trigger warning. It's no secret that Salva grew up in not the best of circumstances. As I mentioned earlier, he was not only abused by his alcoholic stepfather, but his mother as well, and had a strained relationship with at least one of his siblings, if not all, especially after coming out. After this, he uh, filmed a short film entitled There's Something in the Basement, and it was a huge success, so much so that it caught the eye of Francis Ford Coppola, who essentially ended up greenlighting and funding Salva's first feature-length film, Clown House. This is why I did point out the Outsiders poster from the beginning of the movie. The Outsiders, an adaptation of a story, definitely aimed at young hormonal girls with this cast of soon-to-be big-name heartthrobs. Probably was a film that Salva enjoyed. But Coppola would play a more damaging role than just funding and greenlighting this film, and I will bring that up in a moment. Nathan Forrest Winters, again Casey in the movie, would end up meeting Salva around the age of six. And one of Salva's jobs while he was trying to fund his film career was at a daycare. Yeah. From here, he met one of Winters' mom's friends and she ended up connecting him to Nathan's mother who does prop designs and from there they had a professional relationship. After this though is when the grooming began. Of course not only would Nathan be groomed, his parents would as well because Salva of course had to be trusted. Winters would first star alongside Brian McHugh who played Jeffrey in the initial shorts There's Something in the Basement which would catch Coppola's attention. So when Salva went to write this movie, he of course had Winters in mind. Granted, this movie according to Salva was initially a short story that he previously had written, however he did have to expand on it. A lot of um, extra writing was involved. Salva would not only throw in little hints of his sick behavior on film, but he would also have Winters sit on his lap on set in between scenes. Um, behavior that alarmed much of the cast and crew who would then begin to approach Winter's mother and this would result in her questioning him about what was going on with their relationship. 
However, Winters would not come out about the abuse right away as an account of being groomed. Instead, he would confess it to his mother after the movie wrapped up. A police report would then be filed against Salva, resulting in his home being raided, in which CP would be recovered. Not only did he film his encounters and his abuse of Winters, he did also illegally obtain videos of other young boys being abused. He would be sentenced to three years in prison. A laugh just insulting three years that he didn't even come close to finishing. He would only serve 15 months. And even after all of this, Coppola would go on to protect Salva. Now, of course, he did put a lot of money into him, but that does not excuse protecting this behavior. He even went as far as suing Winters' family for $5 million for breach of contract, as well as actively blackballing him from the industry. But with that, Dreading does have a good video that I will link below that actually dives more into the details of everything, as that wasn't what this video was only about I was trying to get into the movie as well in correlation to what happened. Salva, on the other hand, would leave his um, 15 month sentence to only find more success in the industry. He released the Disney movie Powder and then created the mega popular horror franchise Jeepers Creepers, movies that also contain very questionable contents. Hey, you, you did something. You know, I didn't figure it out till enough people looked at me like I was crazy or told me to act my age, but you uh, uh, zapped me or I uh, zapped myself when I touched you, but I've been, uh, I've been running around on this high like I was 18 again. I've had more ideas and more, more focus and better sex than I've had in 10 years. It just gives the impression that Salva really had no remorse. Typically, I like to highlight reviews but that isn't entirely necessary with this movie. A lot of the reviews are people who are bringing up the crime, disappointed that they cannot enjoy the movie because it's just tainted overall and they did seem to like the movie for some reason. I don't like the movie. I, like, I think Sam Rockwell did well, but I think the movie kind of stinks. But now knowing everything that we do, it's no secret as to why Clown House is much more disturbing upon watching in comparison to a movie that is seemingly way more scary like Jeepers Creepers. I mean, we've already learned that Salva has no qualms about including inappropriate scenes and dialogue into his movies and terrorizing semi-naked youth as Vice so aptly puts it. But his inclusion of personal trauma from his own youth while simultaneously inflicting trauma on an innocent child makes watching this movie completely unsettling. It does actually almost give this movie a new meaning, this new layer. When you're thinking about what happened behind the scenes, these clowns in this movie now seem to be the predators. Casey is now this isolated victim, his predator hiding in plain sight an unperceived threat that no one around him seems to take seriously. In fact, this predator is almost a friendly presence to everyone else. Casey does stand up to this predator in the end, but it's not like Casey hasn't endured enough trauma that he is going to have to live with and work on for the rest of his life. I mean, at least that's how I started to interpret the movie the more and more I watched it while having to script this. And I did want to end it right there, but I do want to say one or two quick things. While researching Salva's blog, I came across this article on Medium. It actually just seems more like a blog post. And this person quite literally is defending Victor Salva. Their argument is that he paid for his crime. Um, when? No, he didn't. He got, again, a measly three years and only served 15 months. So he didn't pay for his crime. Even if he fulfilled his full sentence, he still wouldn't have paid them. And they feel that he should be able to continue making movies because they like them. That's why. Now, they also do mention this, this thing that's quite a topic of debate when people get canceled, where they're like, I'm able to separate the artist from their actions. And yes, you might be able to make this argument sometimes, but in this case, no, because Salva can even do it. He couldn't do it. He quite literally used what should have been a big, important opportunity for him to take seriously his big feature-length film as a way to further groom and abuse his victim. 
He even filmed the abuse. So no, he shouldn't be able to make movies. He, he doesn't deserve to make movies. He doesn't deserve to make money off of his movies. He doesn't deserve praise or respect for his movies. And he doesn't deserve for everything to be swept under the rug like it largely has, unfortunately. This is why I feel like Clown House might literally be the scariest clown movie there is. And because of its history, I don't think anything could or should top it. But yeah, the next video will be much more lighthearted. I had a, I had this on the list and I've been wanting to get it out there. It's been bothering me and I know people have talked about this this movie and people have talked about this before. But considering, like I said, I talked about Private Lessons, I figured why not talk about this movie. Even though Private Lessons was all about the movie itself and this is more about what happened behind the scenes, um, I still think it counts. So this was a long one and I think I'll end it here and I hope you made it all the way through. And if that's the case, like, subscribe, comment, and peace.